partner off with their keynote address as such anyway. I, uh, I think the keynote yesterday were actually very informative, but I think uh, today's keynote is, is it's on another level. It's that Dr. Craig uh, Belvet holds a PhD in education technology and is from South Africa and is the developer of the activated classroom teaching model. Um, the ACT model is a first of its kind, uh, cohesive taxonomy of digital age and uh, pedagogic, uh, pedagogies. Underpinned by the ACT model, Craig launched the ACT Online, a series of self-paced and MOOC-based courses aimed at teaching educators how to teach effectively and easily with technology. Craig's trainings uh, and research into effective pedagogy based digital age training has impacted thousands of teachers and lecturers around the world. He is also the author of numerous books covering topics as computer literacy, literacy, database systems, teaching with technology, running, and active living. With over 25 years experience in education, technology, Craig is an internationally acclaimed speaker who seeks to motivate educators to teach differently in our rapidly changing digital world. So could we actually welcome Craig here to do his keynote speech on the topic 21st century education, it's time to act. Craig, over to you. Oh, thanks, Sid. Right, good morning, everyone. Lovely to be here. Good afternoon, evening, uh, Sid, wherever you may be in the world. Uh, it's a great uh, privilege to be able to um, share this time with you, whatever part of the world that you uh, happen to be in. Uh, I'm just gonna quickly uh, share my screen so that we can begin our little journey together. I've entitled this, um, It's Time to Act. And obviously what's quite strange in a way is that, as you well know, uh, the planning of this conference was pre-COVID. And um, for a long time, I've been involved in trying to encourage uh, teachers, lecturers, universities to make a shift to, to online, to make a shift to using more digital and blended um, and not always that successful. And here we sit running this entire conference online, all the good and the bad. Uh, the bad, obviously, sometimes the connections don't work 100%, but the good is, wow, amazing that we can so easily get people from so many countries into one room uh, like this and we can all be together. So I want to share a quick little journey with you uh, in, in the short time that we've got um, around what's happened recently. And we've all been through it, but I want to try and put a little bit of a framework to it. So as of January, uh, most of us were sitting happily on Education Island, thinking another year of university would, would be lying ahead of us, whether you're a teacher, a lecturer, and you know, life would carry on much the same. We would continue to use the OHPs, if you know, remember what OHPs are, OHP projectors, um, our chalkboards and all of those things, and you know, things would be fine. Um, across, across the sort of uh, metaphoric seas was another island, e-education island and this was a place where I don't know other things were happening there were there were some academics and lecturers and, and universities who, who were doing some stuff there but by and large most of us were pretty happy where we were on our traditional island and that's this other glimmering island seemed a little bit complex and that is until Mount Virusius erupted and the COVID lava just spewed over everyone and it just hit us out of nowhere now, obviously, for us in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, it basically hit us just as our year was starting. And so I remember we had just done a, a, a week or two of our semester and there was drama. All of a sudden, you know, the, the government announced there was a national lockdown. And so we all leapt into our little boat and paddled furiously. We just had to get out of there because physically we could no longer be in that venue. We could no longer be in our traditional classrooms. And that was a scary thing for a lot of people. You know, change is a scary thing. Suddenly being forced to do something different and head across to this new digital island wasn't something that we particularly wanted to do. And for a lot of us, even if we had thought we had wanted to do it, well, it's one thing to plan to, to teach in a new way. It's another thing to just be foisted upon you. And here you are on e-education island. You will be teaching using Zoom or Teams or whatever it may be, and that is traumatic. And we've heard yesterday with a lot of the sessions, which have been really amazing to, and just me reflecting on those sessions is, 
we've also been doing research similar to that, you know, students' attitudes and how they've adapted and, and teacher and lecturer attitudes. And it's the same story around the world. We're all in the same boat and we've all landed at the same place. However, a lot of the headlines and of the stuff that we've heard yesterday is we're getting a lot of reports that this is not that good. You know, things like, and this is just media ones, but studies as well. 80% of parents say digital schooling is failing, online classes suck, suck uh, unless challenging remote learning gets failing grades. It, it, it's just not working. And we'll see some of the, the, the results will suggest, well, maybe, you know, it could work in some circumstances, but it's not a new situation. I mean, you can look at those bottom ones, uh, the Los Angeles iPad program failure. I'm sure some of you heard of that. That was back in 2014 where they rolled out iPads to a whole lot of schools and that was a failure. And so it, it's quite a strange situation that often the implementation of technology when it comes to, to the classroom and it comes to, to universities is not effective. But, but this, this concerns me because why is it that technology is a game changer in every other sector? Technology is a game changer in business. You can't be in business if you don't use technology and leverage it. So why doesn't it work in education? Is it the technology that is the problem? And so that's part of what we're all trying to do is we try and unravel these things and we, and we look at models of trying to understand it. Um, I want to very quickly give you a, a sort of broad brushstroke history uh, lesson over the last sort of 5,000 years uh, to give a bit of context. And you've all heard of the fourth industrial revolution. We're living in this age where it's all about tech and big data and connectivity, et cetera, et cetera. I want to suggest that possibly we're living in the fourth education technology revolution as well. And I want to just explain this briefly because I think it gives a little bit of context to where we are and to what I want to look at next. So there's essentially been four education technology revolutions. So way back before any of you were born, back in the old dark ages, uh, all learning was essentially oral. But somewhere along the line, someone figured out, you know what, you can, you can have some sort of writing device. Maybe it was just a stylus on some clay tablet. And that obviously improved and became a pencil and a pen. But those technologies brought about the textual era. And it changed learning from conversation to, to being able to record things. And that had an impact. We're not going to look at the detail of what they had. But then there was another, the second ed tech revolution, which I consider to be the print, the printing press, because this ushered in the print era. And this changed learning again, because all of a sudden you could replicate content. You could take the knowledge that was sitting in the, in the mind of an expert, put it into a book and replicate it. And we ended up in this very instructivist paradigm where, where students would read content, become relatively passive and regurgitate and reproduce that content. And so that was the print era. And a lot of our teaching still happens like that. Well, more recently, for most of us now are, are on the page and know this sort of stuff, the computer was invented. And especially around the early 80s, the computer was coming around. And we entered the digital era. Wow, what could we do with this now? And so we started to see the digitization of education. And so we would have PowerPoints. We, we would have eventually even cool things like videos, like YouTube. And we were now in the digital era. And this was amazing. And we think, well, wow, we are now teaching with technology. But in a, lot, in a way, this tended to simply replicate the previous era. So for example, the textbook became the ebook. The, the teacher became the YouTube video. Um, and all we were really doing is replicating something we had done, but with a silicon coating. But hot on the heels of that was the fourth education technology revolution. And that was the internet. And I want to suggest that this brought about the connected era because all of a sudden the world was connected. All of a sudden there was opportunities to network and, and the core of this was social media and what social, social is about talking, communication. And all of a sudden learning changed almost to like it had been right in the beginning in the oral era. Learning had the opportunity to become interactive because all of a sudden you could have a conversation around content. And so at a broad level, those essentially are the four areas or the four revolutions. Why am I telling you that? Well, I'm telling you that because I believe to a large extent, most of us who have made our way across to e-education in Ireland are essentially sitting on this left-hand side. There are actually two sides to e-education Ireland. There is the digital zone, which is here on the left, 
there is the connected zone, which is here on the right. And as you see down the middle here, there is a little uh, river called the Fourth EdTech River. So we made our way in our little boat through the Sea of Change, past the sharks. Hopefully not too many of us got wrecked and we landed here. And so what have we done? We are on eEducation Island and we're teaching. We're teaching with Zoom and probably putting people to sleep with it. Maybe we're sharing our PowerPoint slides. Maybe up in the north here, because there's a self-paced in a teacher-led zone on this island, maybe up in the north here, we're sharing notes and we're sharing YouTube videos. But there is a fundamental difference between teaching in the digital zone and the connected zone. And the difference lies in activity. And over and over again, I've noticed in the presentations that we saw yesterday, one of the biggest criticisms when we survey students is the lack of engagement. What you are experiencing right now is a classic example of me teaching you in the digital zone. I'm using technology, I'm using Zoom, I'm using PowerPoint, but you are inactive. You are merely sitting there passively consuming what I'm saying. And what does that do? Well, when you consume too much, you slowly lose focus and you're probably drinking your coffee or I don't know, maybe it's your whiskey at the end of the day, whatever it may be, but we're not engaged with the content. But if we move across, to the connected zone. If I bring you into my learning, if I engage you because of intentional use of pedagogy, I can suddenly shift how this experience takes place. And that's exactly what I want to do. And in order to do that, it's not a change of technology. It's a change of pedagogy. And in the middle here, you will see I've got what are called the act bridge of pedagogies. And we're going to use that to shift across to the other side and have a slightly different experience. So at this point, I'm gonna do something interesting. And what you're gonna to need to do in the, now, I need you to quickly go and hopefully you're on your computers, or well, assume you're on your computers. I need you to quite simply open up your browser. And you're probably watching this on Zoom. I just need you to open up your browser and I'm gonna share another screen with you. So open up your browser. If you've got it, you can even do this on your phone if you like. And I want you to go in your browser to www.menti.com. There's the uh, URL at the top there. And I want you to put in that code, 756768. So this will work in any browser. It'll work on your mobile phone because the second part of this presentation we're gonna do here. Now, the reason I'm gonna do it here is I want you to experience something slightly different. Essentially, this is a PowerPoint, but it's a PowerPoint that is built around a connected zone paradigm. But even in itself, the, the, the technology is not so important now, and I wanna demonstrate to you how when we teach a certain pedagogy, things change. So go to menti.com and type in the code 756768. And when you arrive, I'll know you're there, you'll see there's a heart button, I want you to press the heart button. Yes, I can see some love coming in. So I know you're here. Now immediately, I can see people saying, I immediately feel connected. It's changed. With, with just that simple little thing, I now feel like I'm not sitting here by myself, talking to myself as often as the, the situation when we're in these type of things. But I'm gonna lift it a little bit higher than that. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to actually engage with our learning content. Right, so menti.com and the code is 75. 6768, it'll stay on the top of the screen as we move through our presentation now. So what we're gonna now do is we're gonna have a little bit of an experience of what it's like to engage and teach on the other side of the island, on the connected zone. And as I said, this is not about a change in technology. We've got great technology. PowerPoint is fantastic. YouTube is fantastic. Zoom is fantastic. But technology in itself is not enough. We need to have pedagogy as well. There's a fundamental difference between using technology and teaching with technology. And the difference lies in pedagogy. I can show you how to use PowerPoint. I can show you how to use Zoom. But in order to show you how to teach with PowerPoint or teach with Zoom, I need to have pedagogies. And often in our, either because we madly rush to the island or we are dazzled by the technology, we somehow forgot about pedagogy. And so this was where my research has been focused on over the last few years. So you can still join as I jump to the next screen. Right, so the code's there still at the top. So in order to get to the other side, we need a set of pedagogies. 
And so I spent a lot of time trying to understand how modern students learn and spend time essentially living uh, with the natives, you might say, or going into their digital spaces and trying to understand how they were doing things. And out of that emerged a, a taxonomy of pedagogies. Now, there are in fact six there, um, that, or there's five there, there are in fact six pedagogies in total. The lowest of the pedagogies is the pedagogy of consumption. So the first part of our presentation was based around a consumption pedagogy. I spoke, you listened and consumed. So it's a very passive pedagogy. Now, it's not a bad pedagogy. In fact, there is a lot of value in consumption and getting students to read and think and consume. But the ACT pedagogies are pedagogies that are based on activity. And there's a lot of research, if you go and look at it, and I'm sure you're aware of it, around the impact of active teaching and learning. And my own research has just been astounding to see the impact it has on, on students from everything from engagement to recall to, to just their pure enjoyment of the course. So there are five ACT pedagogies, and they are curation, conversation, correction, creation, and chaos. And in the short time I've got, I, I'm going to quickly look at those pedagogies, give you a very brief insight into them, and try and give you a little taste of them. Now, I can't even do them all because there is not a time, but I just want you to get a sense of what it's like to engage using some of those pedagogies. And I'm simply doing it within this one tool, and there are obviously many other tools that we could use to do this. Right, so the ACT pedagogies, as I said, are curation, conversation, correction, creation, and chaos. And, and each of these different pedagogies encourages students to get involved in various activities. So for example, curation is about finding and selecting, arranging, amplifying, et cetera. And each of these activities is designed to encourage the students to be engaged with the content. But not only does that help improve the learning, it has another knock-on and very important effect. And it's also been mentioned in some of the presentations, the development of 21st century skills because these are the things that are gonna stand our students in good stead going forward to be a critical thinker or, a, or, or have visualization or be a problem solver. These skills are vital because content essentially is, is ubiquitous and content changes, but the ability to think about that content, especially in the new AI world we're entering it, is what's gonna distinguish the students that succeed from those who don't. Just take our own experience recently. All of us have our content knowledge, all of us know our domains of expertise. And then we had to rush to this new island with that content. What were the things that enabled us to make that transition? Problem solving, risk taking, persistence, humility, critical thinking. Those were skills that all of us as academics have had to develop over the years and to intentionally design them into the learning of our students is so vital for them going forward. And so, this is the, the ACT uh, model. So very quickly, um, as I said, I'm gonna look at the various uh, pedagogies. So the first pedagogy is the pedagogy of curation. Now, typically when we're teaching students and in all my years that I've been teaching just quite a long time now, um, I followed a, 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 a packaged content approach. So I would say to the student, you're going to learn X, Y, and Z. You're going to learn, mentioned that I'm actually, my computer at the moment is resting on one of my database books. You're going to read chapter 17 and 18 from this database book. And then next week, you're going to do chapter 19 and then chapter 20. And so we give them the content. Yet our students are master curators because that is the essence of what happens when they work in social media. When they go into their profiles, when they are in Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn or Snapchat, chat or wherever it may be, they are deciding what to read. And in order to do that, they have to pull content and they are liking and sharing and pulling a selection of content into their stream. That's curating. But what is the power of curating? In order to curate, they have to read lots of things. They have to make decisions about that content and they have to categorize that content. And that is a powerful learning approach. So rather than simply providing our students with the content all the time, Let's give them the opportunity to curate their own content, to go out there, to become critical readers, to become people who can start to contextualize, to arrange and organize. And that's what curating is about. Let me give you a very, very simple example. Right, so I've got you listed five 21st century skills. Now on your device, on your phone or on your, on your browser, you'll see that you can now rank these. 
So what I want you to do is I want you to rank these in the order that you think it is most important. What is the order that you think is most important that these skills are developed in our students? So if you think persistence is number one, you will choose that in the drop down, and that'll be number one. Then you'll go to the second one and you'll choose the second one and so on. So I'm going to give you a moment to do that. Look at those skills. And those are only five of the 21st century skills that are available. There, there are more than those. I'm just trying to make it a little bit simpler. So I want you to go and have a look at those 21st century skills and then arrange them in order from the skill that you think is, this is the one that we should really be developing in our students, uh, down to number five. And when you've done that, um, they'll start to appear on the screen. So I'm keeping the screen results hidden at the moment because I want you to think about it. I don't want you to look at what others have done. You just ponder what you've got on your screen. So I'm going to give you a moment as we get a couple of results coming up. Now, if you haven't get, managed to get on, menti.com, and there's the code 756768. You can join it any time. Right. So we've got quite a few results coming in. I'm now going to put it on the screen. Okay. So here we go. At the moment, critical thinking is the leader with creativity coming in second and say in problem solving is just coming to third position and problem solving is coming, can problem solving get to second position. And so obviously as the results come in, so they will change. So at the moment we're sitting uh, with critical thinking as number one, creativity number two, problem solving three, risk taking four and persistence five. And that's fascinating. Now, I actually am not that concerned with the order. I'm concerned with what you just did. You see, oh, problem solving is now trying to get up to catch up because it's critical thinking and creativity as more people vote. What's interesting is you were faced with a whole lot of decisions. You had five items that you had to make decisions multiple times. If I choose critical thinking as number one, now what's going to be number two? And if I'd given you 10 to arrange, that would be even harder. You have to think about each of those decisions. And in your own mind, you have to internalize them. But what's also interesting, the moment I put this up here, Let's say you chose creativity as number one. You're looking and say, no, I still believe creativity is more important than critical thinking. Fantastic. What are you doing? You're engaging with the content. You, you are getting your brain to look at that list. Now, if I just provided you the list and said, there's the top five, you would have gone, okay. Wouldn't have thought about it. But the fact that you had to do something with that immediately you start to engage with the content. And so that's just a very, very simple example of curating. I haven't actually gone to get you to go and find content. Um, in fact, yesterday we we're using Padlet. Padlet is a great tool for curating, getting students to take content and put it on the board. We, we had that, that great session yesterday, the breakout session, and we were using Padlet. You can get students to put stuff on Padlet and not only put it there, start to arrange it how they see it fits. What are they doing? They're curating. And as a result, they are getting engaged in learning with the content. So that's a very simple example of using the pedagogy of curation. Right, on to our next pedagogy, the pedagogy of conversation. Now, we tend to do most of our education in a very passive, instructivist way. So what do we do? You stand in front of the class and you deliver. And I, you, you can come to an event even like this. You can be, you could be at a webinar, you could be at a live uh, seminar, and if that speaker goes on too long, what are you going to do? You're going to go, oh, man, you're going to be on your device doing something. We, we just have an inability to concentrate for more than 35, 40, 45 minutes. However, if you go to a coffee shop with your mates, you can sit there and talk with your friends for hours and hours around the dinner table. Why is that? Well, there's a huge difference. The one is one-way communication. The other is active engagement. I say something, you say something. We argue, we debate, we discuss, we laugh. And, and some of the previous sessions have talked about the importance of the human connection, because that's what we're doing. We are enacting the humanity of ourselves. And in fact, when we go right back to how learning originally happened, we talk about it being a Socratic form of learning. Well, I tell you now, we're now in Socratic 2.0. Because with the development of the web and social media, we have brought about an opportunity for that same thing to take place, for us to have engagement and conversation online. And it has a whole lot of major benefits. Well, one of the big major benefits is when you have an online conversation, you have the ability for some level of anonymity, which obviously emboldens our students to say things, especially the shy ones. You have an artifact that remains behind. 
which is really powerful when you get to the next pedagogy, which is the pedagogy of correction, because now you can let these two into play. And so you have opportunities to really engage around the content. Now, I normally use a, another app, but in the, to save time, I'm just going to do, have a little conversation here. So here's your question. What do you think is important for us to be effective in teaching going forward? Right, so I'm gonna give you a moment. You'll see on your uh, device that you've got an opportunity to type something into a little box. So I want you to share your thoughts. What do you think is important if we're gonna be effective teaching going forward? Because it looks like we're gonna be stuck with this whether we like it or not. This is COVID-19, it's dragging on. In our own country here in South Africa, uh, our president came on the news last night just to say, well, uh, because we're on a, only on a level one lockdown, that things are starting to get a bit out of hand again. And whether it's COVID 2021 or some other thing, we are going to be teaching a lot more with blended and online. So how can we be effective? What do you think is important that we should be focusing on thinking about trying to implement if we're going to be effective? Because it's not just about survival. Survival is no longer just the option or what we want to achieve. We, we've got a paper that was presented yesterday and there'll be another one today. Where we talked about emergency online learning and that's what we've all been involved in. The emergency has happened, but we can't live in emergency mode for 2020 and 2021 going on. So what is important? Right, let's put up some of your thinking uh, on the screen. Yes, learning to teach online, absolutely. Building relationships, I, I love that. And, and, and that ties into exactly what conversation is about. Uh, building relationships, I just want to quickly pick up on that just for a moment uh, uh, more. Um, I, I run a webinar, a monthly webinar where I, I invite academics and I work a lot with schools and with teachers. And, and what was really interesting is one of the principles of a school I had on recently said something along the lines of his students would prefer to hear Mrs. Smith then they would watch a Khan Academy video. And you think, well, why is that? You know, the Khan Academy video or the YouTube video is really like well done and professional. They wanted Mrs. Smith because it was about relationship. It was authentic. They could connect with her. And the fact that a dog barked in the background and she didn't look quite perfect and it didn't work out, that's what they wanted. They wanted relationship. So that absolutely is important. We, we need to be adaptable, resilient, Lifelong learners and stay up to date and motivated. Absolutely. We need clear learning outcomes and strategies to implement them to feedback. Primary focus on learning and how to support our learners in the context in their lives. Absolutely, that's very important that we know how to support learners. Um, interaction, feedback from students, exactly what you're doing now. Strategic planning, yes. We need to put in strategies to be able to handle this. Creativity, collaboration, exploring open to new things and trying new things. Interaction, there's that key thing, all about interaction, getting to know your learners better, their outcomes and happiness and wellness. Honest conversations, absolutely. You know, it, it tends to be the emperor's got no clothes and we're all just doing it, but is it actually effective being honest? Continuous professional development. And that's quite an important one and quite difficult for a lot of academics. You know, one thing about academics, is if your country is anything like us, we are here because we're content specialists, not because we're teachers. We, we weren't trained, trained in pedagogy, but all of a sudden, we have to become teachers. It's no good to just dump content, take content and put it online because the students cannot engage with it. And so our role has changed whether you like it or not. And so that continuous professional development is really important. And I love that one there, learning, unlearning and relearning. And yeah, an incentive to be educators, absolutely. So some lovely thoughts there. Now, what we're doing here is you're just really commenting, but we're starting to have a conversation. I can hear you. And there are great tools. Uh, if you're taking notes, there's one called tlk.io, tlk.io. It, it really is just a, a throwaway chat room. I actually normally use that one for demonstrating this type of thing. Um, you put tlk.io, forward slash, whatever you like, and you've got a chat room on the fly that you can have a conversation with your students and then you, it's disposable. But the point is there's so many of these great spaces where we can engage in online conversation while you're having your Zoom session. And so you can keep that conversation going. And so conversation is so important when it comes to online learning and blended learning. The, the, the fourth of our, our pedagogies and the third of the ACT pedagogies is the pedagogy of correction. 
Now, it's quite interesting that we tend to live in a world where, especially as teachers and, and academics, we're quite obsessed with correct. We, things have to be correct. You know, there's a correct way of doing things. It has to be done like this. There is a formula in which you will apply. Yet that's not the world we live in. We live in a world where we all fully understand the way you learn is by mistakes. You don't fall off the bicycle, you don't learn. And, and for all of us, we know that, but how do we embrace that in our teaching? And what's so exciting is the digital age has affordances for that. It enables that far better than the old days. The old days, for those of you remembering back in the overhead projector slide days, I remember having my overhead projector slide and getting all of those written out and arriving at your lecture and you're going to lecture for the semester and have a, a file full of slides and you'll just flip them off and stick them on and there's slide number one. And if you're in slide number 10 and some student put up their hand and says, uh, sir, I just want to mention there's, a, there, there's an error there. It was like, no, there's no error there. There can't be an error there. There's no error there. There's, if there's an error there, I've got to fix all the slides. It's not happening. It's a drama. Well, the digital PowerPoint, oh, there's an error there. No problem, change it. And, and it enables us to make changes so easily. And therein lies the learning. This presentation, which I've done multiple times and versions of this presentation constantly evolve. As I hear what all of you were saying yesterday, I'm, I'm bringing it into here, I'm changing it. It's not correct. It's correcting. I call it the wiki era. You know, we might hate on Wikipedia, but Wikipedia is an example of a collaborative space that is never correct. Just as Encyclopedia Britannica was never correct, you get fooled to think because it got bound and stuck in a book, it was correct. It is busy correcting and digital is so much better like that. But do we actively embrace that approach in our teaching, encouraging learning through mistakes? So here's the opportunity. There is a quiz. And I, I'm sure partner's got some grand prize. I can just imagine. It, it's probably a trip to South Africa. All expenses paid, virtual trip. Oh, what a prize it's going to be. Right, so hoping you have been focused and concentrating because we have a quick quiz together now. In the spirit of correction, let's see if you're hearing what I'm saying. And that's what correction is about. I'm not talking merely about summative assessment. Building correction is part of the learning, not just part of the assessment. So there's going to be a couple of little questions. We're going to have a couple now, then I'll finish off with a couple right at the end. The way this works, you answer the question at multiple choice, you're going to answer it on your device. The faster you answer, the more points you get. So you want to be quick, 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 quick. But you don't want to be quick and wrong. Okay, because quick and wrong gets no points. Okay, so I am, the spirit of correction, going to ask you things that you need to think about and you're going to be tempted to answer immediately. Pause just for a second before you answer, but obviously don't pause too long. So it's a bit of a tension here. Get it right and get not so many points or get it wrong and get zero points, but maybe get it right and get both. So here we go. Are you ready? Let the quiz begin. So as I said, you need to be nice and speedy to do this. Question number one, your first question. The fourth EdTech revolution ushered in the which? Digital era, connected era, print era, or oral era? There is a countdown happening at the moment. If you don't get to answer before the end of that, you will get zero points. Which of these is correct? Three seconds, two seconds, one second, bang, time is up. Let's see how you did. Four people listening to me, yes. I'm worried about those others. We've got three said the digital era, one said the print era. Okay, now, if you're my students, I'm thinking, okay, yes. Some of you didn't hear me. There is a difference between the digital and the connected era. The fourth edtech revolution was the internet. The third was the computer. The computer brought about digital. The internet brought about connected. And we want to make sure we are using connection in our teaching. So let's see how the leaderboard stands after that round. So here we go. As I said, the faster you answer, the more points you get. So standing at the top of the leaderboard is Anonymous Mousehead with Martin Lorraine and Isha, the top four. But don't worry, anything could change. Here we come to question number two. So remember, speed is what you want to get to the top, but you also want to be accurate. Okay, very simple question. Whose logo is this? I just put this one in because I like everyone to get one question right. No one ever gets this one wrong because it's such a simple question. Oh, 
and I know you all being academics, you all get this right. You're very intelligent people. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Right. So we should have 100%, two seconds, one second, and time is up. Right. Oh, no. Oh, no. This is so embarrassing. Oh, oh Pastor, I don't know what to do. Five of them got it wrong. Oh, no. Ah, now there are two options. You called it WhatsApp instead of WhatsApp. Okay. And I love including this question because people either rush and answer too quickly or you actually think it's called WhatsApp. Now, if you want to look cool with your students, just a little hint, don't tell them, okay, we're going to be using WhatsApp and Twitter for our classes. It's WhatsApp and Twitter. Right. But six of you did get that right. How did it change the leaderboard? That is the question. Oh, Anonymous getting it wrong. Martin, the, the top three getting that wrong. Bang, dethroned. We're going to have a change of leaderboard. Oh, and Isha jumped to the top. Mohammed, Anonymous, Martin, and Maverick. Yeah, you see, anything can change. Okay, question three. Remember, be careful when you answer the question. Specifically, this one. The pedagogy of correction is about being prepared to make. Think twice before you answer. I've warned you. Don't think once. Think twice before you answer. Yeah, I can see those answered quickly. Didn't think twice. You thought you thought twice, but you thought once. Let's see. Three seconds, two seconds, one second. Time's up. Right. Oh, man. I warned you. I did try and warn you. I said think twice. The pedagogy of correction is about being prepared to make mistakes. So you looked at it and you said, oh, look, those three have got spelling mistakes. I won't choose it. That's thinking once. Thinking twice, you would have said, but I must be prepared to make a mistake and choose it. But no, all of you chose the one that had no mistakes. You, you're speaking the words, but not acting on them. If it's about being prepared to make mistakes to learn, surely you should have made a mistake. But no, you didn't. You didn't learn the lesson. Well, the good news is, because you all got it wrong, well, the leaderboard didn't change. Right, so we're going to leave that for a moment. I'm going to come back to the last two questions at the end. And we will see who gets crowned. Right, the second to highest of the pedagogies is the pedagogy of creation. And, and this is such a powerful pedagogy because it shifts us from being consumption-based people to being creating. For example, why make your students watch a YouTube video when they could actually go and create the content around that? They could create a video for you. And, and there are so many tools that really encourage us. And I, I don't have time to... To actually do this in this session but if you want to have an, an example and i'm not going to do this now there, there is a fantastic whiteboard called whiteboard.fr if you go to that link you will see uh, one that i normally use for the session um, and why i love this whiteboard is it's a great collaborative creating space but what's different is each of the students has their own space to create and you can see all these spaces and choose how you share it but it is a fantastic space for students to think mathematically, creatively, whatever. And the amazing tool, just grab your student's cell phone. What a great tool for encouraging, creating as a pedagogy. As I said, I'm not gonna do that one because we don't have time. I wanna get into the last pedagogy as we wind up, and this is the pedagogy of chaos. Now we live in a world where we tend to teach in a very controlled and ordered way. You go through chapter one, two, three, four, the answer is in the back of the textbook. But actually, the world we live in is a chaotic world. It's the, what Donald Trump would call the fake news world. Too much information, conflicting information. It, it, it's a world that is confusing. How do we teach our students to make sense of that chaotic world? Well, we need to embrace a pedagogy that's something that we would think we wouldn't normally have. We wouldn't think that chaos is a pedagogy that it should be associated with teaching and learning. Well, I want to put it to you that the ability to make sense of noise, and see patterns is absolutely vital in our modern day and age. It's a student's ability to reorganize. I love this quote from William Dole. The teacher must intentionally cause enough chaos to motivate the student to reorganize. Now, uh, there is a little site, uh, well, this, I don't know if you can clearly see the link at the bottom. Uh, so on one of my websites, we created this little tool called Act Quick. Uh, there's the link, actonline.co forward says Act Quick. And this is a great tool if you want to create pressure because there are two sides to chaos. Chaos is about creating pressure and then perception because in the pressure, in that giving to students a time pressure or too much choice or co overloading content, 
we start to develop perception. That's what a gym does. That's why you go to a gym. And our keynote yesterday was talking about this physical, mental fitness. You are putting pressure on yourself in order to develop muscles. And the same applies when it comes to the pedagogy of chaos. So I've got a minute left. I'm going to give you an option. You've got one minute. And I want you to write a poem about how you're feeling about modern teaching. Right, so I'm giving you one minute to do that before we finish off this entire presentation. So one minute. You have a minute to write a poem. Doesn't have to rhyme, this poem doesn't have to rhyme about how you are feeling about teaching in the modern digital age. So your minute is now ticking away. Twenty seconds. All right. Let's see who managed to come with a poem. Great, fantastic, connected, exciting, and student centered. I am feeling good. I am feeling energized. I am feeling cool. Look at them. In short, I am inspired. Challenging, fun, worthwhile. Am I past this? I think not. <laughs> Why are we even teaching? Life got too complicated. Who wants to learn in these times? Do we have anything new to learn? Right. So what am I doing? I'm essentially trying to create a little bit of pressure for you to consolidate your thinking. And this is just a little fun creative activity. But I was creating a time pressure on you and trying to force you to think. Right. So my time is just about up. So I want to now just <laughs> uh, finish off. So... This is the connected era. I've tried to give you a little taste of what it's like to learn in a connected way. And I've only used one tool, but there's so many tools that we can use to learn in this exciting way. But before we finish, I want to finish with our final two questions so that we can see who is going to be the master and the winner of the grand prize that all paid expenses paid virtual tour into South Africa. The piece we miss when educating with technology is which of these? And you've only got a few seconds to get your answer in. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is up. Let's see. Yes, I have been successful in pedagogy. Fantastic, you see. And so I've been able to reflect and see, well, you were hearing me. And I'm not going to show you the leaderboard. I'm merely going to show you one more question, and then we will see who is the winner. So here we go, the final question. On so fast to get more points, and let's see who is the winner. The key to connected era education is which of these? The key to connected era education is which of these to answer the piling in as fast as you can. Three, two, one, time is up. And active learning engagement and the correct answer is all of those. Absolutely. Digital aid pedagogies, active learning, paradigm shifts, engagement. These are the things then enable us to teach effectively in our new connected era. And so the winner would have been the one who answered the fastest. So let's see who is crowned the ultimate winner on the top of the leaderboard as there's a mix up as the points come in, everything is tallied. And here we have a drum roll. And the winner is Isha. Well done Isha, everyone goes crazy. Ticket a parade, wherever you are, whoever you are, you have done well and you deserve great accolades with Lorraine, Mohammed, and Anonymous anonymous ed coming in next right so well done to isha that is fantastic right so that's basically what i wanted to say if you want to find out more about uh some of my work uh you can find that at education.org uh, and i work together with people like uh, dr singh and others uh where we really try and find ways of, of bringing the, the collective brain set, and, and I, I think there was, what Sid was saying earlier, it's so important that we do collaborate and try and bring this collective brain set together uh, so that we can try and achieve great things going forward. So uh, that's all I wanted to say, that I, I think it is time that we move and become uh, more effective, more activated, more engaging in our teaching. The opportunities are there, the technology is there, but it's just that we need to take a different approach to it. And so not, let's not do the death bar bullet point as we did for many years when we teached with, uh, with our digital era. We can move across to the connected era and kill them with Zoom and put them to sleep. There are far better ways of doing it. 
So uh, that is all from me. And uh, at this stage, I will many just uh, stop my share. And uh, I don't know if we've got a minute left uh, for any questions. Right, so that's all. Thank you, everyone.